Hi, I'm going to do a talk about socialism, communism, and capitalism. So these are some uh, political, governmental, economic thoughts that uh, are going through people's minds right now, in particular in the American public. And so I'm going to kind of dissect these things and how to think about these things um, from the financial and governmental aspects. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Keller Barnett. I um, have been active in politics, campaigning for different political uh, people for a number of years. And I, um, in my spare time, my w when I'm educating myself, I read um, philosophical and old governmental texts, um, as well as some scientific literature. So um, some people, The Rights of Man, the autobiography of Ben Franklin, Jefferson's works, his collective works, including his autobiography, um, ph philosophers Karl Popper, uh, you know, did Plato's Republic, that's pretty standard, um, and, a, and a few other little philosophies here and there, and then for scientific literature, or a mix of the two, um, Nikola Tesla, I really enjoy um, the problems of increasing human energy and uh, I read some snippets of Einstein's collectives wor collective works getting into his theory of relativity some that's kind of fun um, and then uh, regarding uh, let's see here uh, so that's what I do when I'm educating myself when I'm by myself I guess you could say and then it, in my social and charitable activities I do, I uh, participate in some social clubs and try to encourage uh, political social involvement. And then for my business, uh, on my business side of things, I'm a certified public accountant. I do accounting, investing. Um, I got this crypto that I work with, Bitcoin 1776. And I, um, yeah, and business stuff. Do a big variety of business stuff. So, okay, let's go ahead and get on down to it. Socialism, capitalism, and communism. So, a lot of people think of these things as if you are either socialist or you're communist or you're capitalist. When it, governments and societies have a mix of these things uh, throughout them. Um, you're not really just one or the other. You, you never really are uh, just one or the other, at least not in the modern day. Now, some are more extreme um, than others, and that's kind of how we define them. But let's go ahead and talk about uh, when, when people think of socialism, and then, you know, there's the loaded term socialism, which people may say, well, if you're socialist, you must be communist, or if you're socialist, um, then you have to be against, uh, you know, capitalism, and so forth. There's the, or, or socialism means you know starvation and death, or socialism means everybody has health care and jobs and so forth. And these these are kind of like the loaded thoughts um, behind the words. But let's let's just break down aspects of socialism and aspects of communism and capitalism, etc. So and primarily I'll be dealing with the American government. Um, a lot of people are familiar with that. It's it's a very big government relative to, let's say, that of France or Britain. But, you know, the EU is a si quite a similar size. So is uh, perhaps uh, China and so forth. So um, anyways, so let's go ahead and get down to it. So socialism, what are aspects of socialism and, and what does socialism itself, without the added things that go along with it, um, what does socialism mean or, or how is it in our society? So um, when people think of socialism, they primarily think of protecting the poor or the impoverished or the, the, low, the low bars of society. Um, in American society, we have that through uh, free elementary education or basic education um, for, for elementary uh, aged people. And then we also have aspects of socialism in our earned income tax credit, 
um, child tax credit, which these things can, if you're a single person with two kids, this might amount to um, nine to twelve thousand. It it could be nine thousand dollars quite easily, um, even if you have a small bit of employment. Um, so that's an aspect of socialism, which is uh, which I'm defining as uh, the dispersion of assets to a wide group of people. Okay, so um, and and but now when I say assets. It's important to understand that socialism is also very cultural. Um, so some religions, um, you know, such as the Christian, for one, people are very familiar with, but also the Muslim. Um, many religions are kind of socialist in nature, and cultures and languages are um, socially dispersed as well, wh whereas some others are not. Um, and for the American public, they're not very familiar they're not very well familiarized with exclusive religions or um, antisocial uh, religions. But if you say uh, geneticists, uh, people who say that you need to be born into this religion or, you know, any regard where you're born into a religion, that is something of an antisocial behavior rather than saying that people get to choose whether or not they want to be part of it. Um, and then... Uh, well, anyways, so, so that's in, and then in, in regarding cultures, some cultures and languages try not to make their culture or their language well known or widespread. They kind of keep it as a secret language. Um, for example, back in the 1900, uh, early 1900s and the 1800s and so forth, back in this time, Latin was something of a secret language of scientists or um, something that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, French is, has been, for continental Europe, kind of the secret language of politics or, or, or treaties in particular. So um, sometimes, like English, the English language is one that, generically speaking, um, we say that we want everyone to learn or adopt or be familiarized with English and the rules in which how you can use the English language are pretty much up to whomever speaks it. There's no real formal rules with what the meaning behind words mean. Um, whereas with French, there's quite a lot of formal rules and this is why it was, or at least why it said it was used in treaties. And then um, with uh, the scientific languages, um, or Latin, which is not common today, but um, science kind of uh, stepped aside from the use of common languages for the use of Latin. And one way to prevent the common people from adopting the, the technology, but also um, common people load terms, whereas if you simply use a different language like Latin and uh, people say the phrase hypothalamus. This means nothing. And it, um, people don't have emotional attachment to the phrase hypothalamus or um, for Greek, I, I believe it's Greek, uh, ge geometry. Um, people don't really have attachment to the, w to the phrase geometry, um, whereas people might have attachment to the phrase um, measuring the earth. Or, for example, the phrase climate change, which uh, can just mean changes in climate, changes in weather, or prolonged changes in weather over a long period of time. Um, people have a very, uh, in the English language, they have a lot of emotional attachment to these phrases. So uh, that, that goes well beyond the strict, the minimal definition of what it means. So, um, so that's aspects of socialism or, or social behavior. You have uh, where you a, there's cultural socialism, which generically speaking, um, most cultures are very open and aggressive with the um, adoption of their culture, their language, their mannerisms, their morals, and their virtues. So this is one form of socialism. Um, and then there's 
uh, what you could call protecting children and protecting the impoverished, the migrants, um, uh, the ill, the elderly, this other form of socialism which America has through social security uh, system, which America has through um, elementary education, and America has through the in earned income tax credit in the child care or child tax credit and child care tax credits. All these, all these things are aspects of socialism. Okay, so let's go into uh, communism and how people think about communism. Okay, uh, communism, when you think about, uh, you know, the difference between socialism and communism, socialism primarily deals with people and in some regard you can say the state or the nation but the state owns the people that are born within that nation. Um, and some people might say, you know, the, the migrants who become citizens, etc. But um, the real issue is when you deal with people who are born into it um, rather than those who have a choice on whether or not to be there. Um, and so uh, socialism is kind of the state ownership of people. And when you get into communism, you're dealing more with the state ownership of property. Um, so so uh, communist behavior within the American government. Um, some, the, um, oh, the marginal tax credits, uh, I, mean, I mean the marginal tax rates, how they increase when incomes go up, that is a form of the state reclaiming uh, pieces of property from those who've increased the worth of their property or the the worth of their um, their their taxable income technically different but uh, people view it as generically similar so the marginal tax rates and the ways that those increase as people become wealthier that is a form of the state reclaiming portions of property um, antitrust laws anti-monopoly laws that is a form of the state limiting how much how the uh, extent of the growth that one is able to achieve um, so uh, those are those are some basic forms of communist type of uh, behavior so when you think of communism it's more of reducing reducing the extremely rich or the extremely good and wealthy depending on how you want to define these things but limiting the maximum amount one could achieve and socialism is about minimizing um, the uh, the maximum downside that one or despair that one can fall to so communism is kind of limiting the top and socialism is limiting the bottom, preventing people from going to the bottom, preventing people getting too high to the top. These are like the communist and socialist aspects of government and communism deals much more with property, whereas socialism deals much more with people. And then uh, to address capitalism, capitalism is um, it's much more about um, you can kind of think about it as laissez-faire economics, but um, or very little government or very little political, uh, net, uh, political, s federalized political systems. But um, capitalism, in in our society, we we often we often think of it as individual responsibility, but um, true capitalism or or um, structured capitalism. It's much more about clubbed, clubbed uh, responsibility or clubbed uh, organization or, or family dynasties as people think about it. So rather than saying that each child is responsible for his own welfare, we think that the parent or the parent and their associated relations, relations and relationships are responsible for the welfare of the child. Uh, just two-year-olds are not individually responsible for themselves. And then um, also when we think about capitalism, rather than um, saying that 
there's no possibility of people forming agreements and, col and forming collective, we say that, let's say between the eight or 12 of you, you write agreements that you 12 are bound to, but there's not an overarching or very limited overarching agreement that everyone, all 300 million people within the US or you know more, but all 300 million people within within the US, they are not bound to any particular agreement um, of financial and um, uh, financial or governmental obligation. So, so capitalism is, um, it can become socialist or communist on a very small scale, but as the whole, uh, capitalism is very laissez-faire and you choose whom you want to interact with, you choose which clubs you want to belong to, and the individual has a lot of free movement um, within capitalism. Whereas uh, socialism and communism, there's an overarching structure that governs everyone um, it, with, within the nation. So let's kind of talk about some organizations which uh, demonstrate some of these behaviors more than others. So when you think of capitalism, um, sports teams or sports in general are rather uh, capitalist in nature and also the mafia and i choose the mafia more because you see this on tv so people are very familiar with it if you've seen the sopranos um that's a very um easy easy learning tool for learning how um cap how capitalist structures are set up within real society as opposed to just people going willy-nilly. Um, but so why are sports teams uh, capitalists rather than socialists and communists? Well, um, people who are within the sports teams, they get paid differently. Um, the requirements to join the sports team is, it's pretty much a universal, you just have to, let's say, be good at basketball. Um, you don't have to pay $200,000 in order to get the basketball certificate that the government gives you that says that you're allowed to play basketball and then you perform your basketball. Um, and you don't have to play basketball, you know, there's some rules, but you don't have to dribble in a particular way. You don't have to shoot in a particular way. Um, there's some generic rules that are set up and as long as you're within those rules. Uh, then you get to participate in the game of basketball. So that's how um, basketball is kind of a very, or sports in general, is very capitalist in nature. And then in terms of the mafia on the Sopranos, just to summarize the relevant aspects to it, um, there's there's a few different levels in the, the mob. I'm not gonna use the correct terms, but that's fine. The lower level guys, they go about and they try to earn or squeeze or whatever. They go about earning, and if they earn, let's just say, a hundred thousand bucks or something like this throughout the course of a year, then they take twenty-five percent of that, and for the start of the series, they give that to Tony, and then Tony takes all of his earnings, and he takes five percent of this, um, or what you know, twenty-five percent of Tony's earnings, which is a portion of the people below him, um, and he gives this to uh, Grandpa. Uh, in the TV show, it's Joe, Uncle Joe, for a little bit, a period of time. Um, but it's very much set up in a family hierarchy. The children earn money, and the parent get 25% of what the children earn, and Grandpa basically gets 5% of what the children earn, or something they're about. And um, so capitalism can be organized very efficiently on the family unit um, and the advantage of organizing capitalism or, or, or a mafia type system within the family unit is that the parent um, they get rewarded for making their children into profitable members of society whereas in traditional uh, American customs today not back in the day but in traditional American customs today, there is no benefit to the parent for having children virtually at all. And um, as you can kind of see in American society, children, uh, parents invest very little to their, in their children unless they have the means, and then sometimes they do. But um, there's, there's very little motivation 
uh, to better the lives of children in American society today. Um, and then in terms of the management of money, the children keep all the money that they earn and there is no a grandpa or a grandma, uh, the grandparent, the grandparent is not very involved in the financial well-being or the the collective well-being of the management of resources for the dispersed family units. So, um, anyways, it can be, uh, throughout time, um, there have been some peoples that have had a much more structured capitalist uh, setup, like I kind of mentioned before. Um, I'm not going to reference them, but there have been some peoples who have had this. And uh, back in the American Revolutionary time, um, the way that it worked for, because uh, people talk about the burdens of having one or two children today and how, how much of a burden this is. Um, but back during this time, 1776, uh, people were having uh, eight to 12 children with real regularity. There, a lot of regularity of having 8 to 12 children. And we don't really think about how families were able to survive having so many children if they treated children the way that they do now. And um, there was no government. There was no concept of socialism or communism. I mean, some concepts. But there's no practical application of these um, and so how did the American people, how did American families, why were, why were they just um, in European culture, ancient culture rather, in the 0 AD era, up till about 1000 AD, it went on for quite a while, um, between 0 AD and 1000 AD in particular, uh, there was quite a lot of... Um, it's, it it kind of gets ugly to think about, but just a late-term abortion. Um, a lot of children were burned in fireplaces or, or pits or just killed um, to remove the cost of parenting the child. Uh, there was not a lot of abortion within the womb. Some of it was, but you would just wait till the child children were born and then uh, kill them at that time or sacrifice them to the gods. Um, is what they said, but it's really just a, a, a way of, you know, population or, or, or abortion, you know, late-term abortion. So um, this is very common in Europe and Greek in the Mediterranean era, era from, uh, you know, the B.C. to 1000 A.D., and then it kind of stopped or died down around 1000 A.D. Um, but then in American society, this was just not even a thing. I mean, by, th by this point people were not burning children in fireplaces regularly. And so um, how did Americans grow and survive without any inherited wealth to deal with? So in a communist society for communism to work, you have to have a, an established pool of assets to take away from. Um, or in a socialist uh, society where you're, you're redistributing portions of assets, well, still, you have to have established assets to take away from. And the people who moved to America were quite often poor, immigrant, uh, refugees of some sort. Some were wealthy and adventurers and so forth. Uh, some were intelligent and wanted freedom from the oppression. But uh, many people were um, refugees and migrants of, of the very common nature. So what they did during that time is that uh, children were taught in some regard, um, largely family taught, but also schools. Schools were a thing. Um, but children were taught until they were 12 to 14. And I mean, yeah, 12 to 14 ish. And then from the ages of 14 to 21, uh, children were indentured servants to the parent or to their enterprise. So the parent would be a farmer and the child would be a burden to the parent until they were roughly 12 to 14. And then the par parent would put them to work on the farm in which the parent would only continue paying minimal living costs and so forth. And they would get uh, seven years of free labor from the child. And this would sort of pay for 
uh, the cost of raising them up until that point. And parents had um, enterprises in which to employ the child. So basically every family had an enterprise and a purpose and a way to profit from having children. And this is why you see families have such large children and not uh, become impoverished instantly. Yes, they, they're impoverished the majority of their lives, but they're not just killing their children or, or they're not all just dying off. This is the way that families ha justified or economically sustained having children um, back before government or before uh, accumulated assets to sustain the cost of children. So that's how it kind of worked during that time. Um, so let's kind of talk about some of the political, well, yeah, I'll talk about a little bit about the political leaders and the thoughts there. So um, Benjamin Franklin was very much a capitalist. Um, he rejected the indentured servitude that his parents wanted him to do. And he ran off from home around the age of 12 to go start his own living. Um, and he, and uh, Franklin ran off and, and started working for people just wherever he could, um, uh, eating very meagerly and surviving just by his wits at the age of uh, 12 and four, 14 thereabouts. Um, but uh, Franklin was very much a capitalist. He did not support in any way uh, large established governments. He was a little bit pessimistic in terms of his views toward man's ability to improve um, or to make direct improvements toward the well-being of um, society on the large. Uh, on the small, Franklin very much had faith and hope for humanity, but on the large, he kind of thought that um, it was just bound to kind of fall apart or the, pe the, the voices that would become so dominant once you branch out. His l the limit of his organizations for the most part were around uh, 12 members. This is what he suggested as an optimal size of governmental unit or social units was uh, 12. And this, uh, there's kind of like some Jewish tradition behind that as well, um, and religious tradition behind that. But, um, but Franklin opted, f and also family sizes. Family sizes are approximately 12 at this time. So, um, but Franklin opted for the optimum size of 12 for, for government to be organized within, or social clubs to be organized within. And um, generically speaking, when it came to the formation of large government, uh, uh, from what I've read, Franklin was for the most part quite standoffish, frankly, um, and uh, just allowed everybody else to uh, kind of say whatever they wanted to say. And then also when it comes to taxation, which is kind of interesting, uh, Franklin was supportive of a flat tax per person. So he wanted, uh, when he proposed taxes, not to say that this was a major focus of his, but he was the postmaster and money master um, a variety of political positions and largely the architect of the American Revolution and the development of social society. Um, he wanted a tax of, like if we were to quantify it today in U.S. dollars of today, it'd be a tax of $7,000 per person, just everybody, universal, you know, a, a, instead of a universal basic income, a universal basic tax of seven thousand dollars in in today's money it'd be seven thousand dollars per person now however when you don't have a government or or a or a, a real strong federalized government as we do today um the federalized governments that america has and and uh europe has etc these governments didn't really exist or at least for america it did not exist until um, after the Civil War, or roughly the 1900s. Um, before that, the average tax that the average person paid to a federal government, or really to almost any government in general, was virtually nothing. Virtually nothing. It might be, uh, in today's money, maybe 500 bucks a person. 
um, for all the taxes for the, all the governments. Um, we hear the statement of no taxation without representation as the rallying cry for the American Revolution, but more practically, it was just no taxation. Um, there wasn't once you had the representatives the local representatives deciding the tax there were just very 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 few taxes um, but when when Franklin wanted to set up the tax system he wanted to have a flat tax per person of a set amount equal for all purpose persons and let's just talk about why he wanted to do that briefly he wanted to do that to discourage um, to economically discourage slavery and uh, rather than make the law condemning slavery or outlawing slavery he wanted to economically destroy the practice of slavery and you might say well why does a flat tax do that well the output of a slave is significantly less than the output of a free man or a freed man uh, person but uh, so uh, the slave the slaves output was generally seen to be 25 percent of what a freed person was willing to work and do on their own so slaves are driven by negative consequences of let's just say the whip uh, but there's negative consequences for not working whereas freed persons were um, experienced positive consequences positive results from working so the more they worked the better their lives became whereas a slave the more they worked it doesn't really matter so long as they did the minimum uh, it, it, slave slaving is all is more about doing the minimum to avoid punishment whereas um, freed peoples freed peoples try to do the maximum to increase their reward or until they get to a point that they're happy um, so when Franklin was setting up this flat tax per person um, this would have destroyed very quickly um, the practice of slavery because slaves were unprofitable as humans if you if you treat slaves as a human resource which is kind of a socialist behavior but if you treat humans as a human if you as a human resource for the nation or the government then um, and you tax them equally then the more unproductive people uh, the employer would no would never want to pay the taxes for the unproductive people and he would try to get rid of them and then the thought being that once the slaves were freed from the impression the oppression of their employers then they would go on to in, improve their station in life and improve their um, their general desire to earn so in very many respects uh, or economically or governmentally Franklin was very much a capitalist or a libertarian you can kind of think similarly um, however culturally and when it comes to education um, uh, Franklin was very much a socialist in this regard he believed in spreading education widely and for the advancement of social clubs um, ad hoc not government run um, but voluntary social clubs uh, for the improvement of and well-being of, of society so this was in this respect Franklin was very much a socialist so so that's why it's good to break these break these terms apart socialist and communist and capitalist to kind of see how in different times ha in different aspects do, do our governments or how have people talked about these things so let's talk about socialism so some aspects of socialism is elementary education this is definitely a form of socialism um, where the the government or the collective people provide for educational resources to children now this has always been done um, it didn't just start when the federalized government uh, ran education in the 1900s but before then neighborhoods and communities would pick one school teacher or one school math, uh, principal of sorts um, to run a variety of schools 
So what uh, the way it, the way it commonly worked back in the 1700s and early 1800s, etc. But back in the 1700s, the way it worked is, let's say you would have 20 neighborhoods. Each neighborhood would have one school, generally one room, maybe a few rooms, but generally one room. And then, um, and then there would be a principal who would drive around to these 20 schools um, and keep up with these teachers and so forth. So that's the way that the school system kind of worked um, before the federalized school system took over America. Um, and the advantages and pluses and minus to this, you had a lot more of a um, local control of the educational process and local involvement in the educational process. And you had a lot more um, variety in education, um, as well as ability to scale. The good kids were taken out of the, the basic class and put into more advanced classes when possible, which were boarding schools because transportation was difficult, etc. Um, but you still had advanced placement um, like you do today. Um, and you, you had some uh, free college and scholarships for children that were showing promise. Um, scholarships and free college was definitely a thing even in the 17 and 1800s um, were applicable for the kids who uh, the teachers and the grades etc um, for the ones who showed promise but anyways so schools are examples of um, socialism and another example of let me think if there's another well that's, that's probably, I guess, the best I can come up with. W w welfare systems are also uh, socialist in nature. But um, anyways, so, so let's talk about some other, uh, some other aspects. Um, now, regarding the socialist, Franklin's view of socialism, when he defined, when he defined economic socialism... So there's cultural socialism, which education and language and culture, this is a f uh, child caring. This is largely aspects of uh, cultural socialism. And then there's economic socialism, which the way that Franklin encouraged uh, economic socialism is through just working hard. Um, those who work harder, earn more money, provide more good to society. These people, um, they improve their own wealth. That's very true. But their own wealth benefits society at large. And then also the more, um, if you say, let's just say uh, computer programmers, doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever. Um, if you say that these people are a scarce resource and then more and more people acquire these skills and relieve the uh, pressure of the scarcity of the research resource so that more people can have access to medicine, education, financial advice, and uh, legal counsel, etc. Um, then you are providing a social good to society. So just working in, a, in and of itself was a form of socialism in Franklin's mind. Um, uh, the development of hiring people, the development of virtues and morals is another form of socialism. And then um, hiring people, this is another uh, method of socialism. So sometimes people hire and they kind of enslave the people that they hire and these people become burdens to government. And other people who hire, they improve and develop those who work for them, or their slaves, however you want to phrase it, but they improve and develop those who work for them so that they become worth more, and then the employer uh, gets a bigger cut of what, they're, of what they're doing. So if you pay someone $15 an hour and you're able to sell his skills, for let's just say $20 an hour, then you're getting a very small margin, 25% of what you sell his skills for and the rest goes to the person. But if you take this person who you're able to sell for 20 bucks an hour and you increase what you're able to sell them for and you, you make them worth $40 an hour and 
pre they're currently getting paid 15 well now you're getting a much bigger cut of the overall pool and then even if you increase their wages to twenty dollars an hour and you're selling them for forty dollars an hour then while well, you're still getting fifty percent cut rather than twenty five percent of the cut and um, the employer the employee is also making a thirty three percent raise in this scenario so there are ways in which uh, employers strongly benefit the employees that work for them or or you could say they're slaves um, so there's good masters and then there's bad or oppressive masters who um, put their employees into um, making poor long-term decisions such as jeopardizing their long-term health you know without real thought um, behind this having them be employed for a long period of time without providing um, job improvement uh, education perhaps um, or otherwise burdening them in such a way that prevents their mobility in, in a free society like America is where you have the option of quitting and moving to a different employer but um, employers that kind of try to uh, put down their employees not emotionally but physically and um, financially yes emotionally too but um, so, so there's bad and good employers within this. Uh, job training is another form of socialist behavior. So socialist behavior, you could think of protecting the small. And in terms of the revolutionaries at the time period, Thomas Paine was very much a socialist. And uh, later revolutionaries, Malcolm X, he, in a, he was a nationalist socialist. And uh, Adolf Hitler was also a very strong socialist uh, anti-communist so you you shouldn't conflate socialism and communi communism as being the same thing uh, Malcolm X Adolf Hitler Thomas Paine all these people were very much uh, socialists um, Thomas Paine recommended that all children at the age of 21 basically once they were done with serving their parents and they did their indentured servitude to their parents um, Thomas Paine suggested that all American children, whatever, all children within the nation should get a certain amount of money to start their lives with. I can't recall the amount of money he suggested, but it was a fairly substantial sum, frankly. Um, and whereas in American culture, we do give children some amount of money. We give them um, credit card debt, which might be 20000 or a $30,000 loan to do with what they can. Um, and then we also uh, give children a hundred thousand dollars to purchase a certificate of paper that is largely meaningless but this is um, we call it education but it's not really education uh, this is not what the children are getting they get this certificate of paper and we loan them a hundred thousand dollars to acquire a certificate of paper um, sometimes we make we we oblige people to have these certificates of paper in order to earn lots of money which is an, a very anti-socialist behavior. So um, there's some ways in which societies bring poor people up, and then there's other ways they push them down. Um, and it's important to recognize when societies are pushing people down. So requiring people to have $100,000 certificates of paper um, to in order to practice medicine, law, accounting, or other similar professions this is very much a way to push poor people you know into the ground and prevent the change of wealth too drastically it, it largely does not serve the um, stated benefit of protecting society at large from manipulation and um, uh, I mean we just see this with uh, the malpractice in medicine is still quite high today and you could say the ripoff practice of medicine um, similarly with the ripoffs within the financial systems it's a very 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 high and the scam behavior of the financial system is very high the uh, scam nature of universities um, and the misleading marketing that they have is incredibly high and um, and legal uh, legal has just gone a little bit crazy in terms of the pricing and the pettiness of law. So petty law 
and imprisonment. This is another form of uh, antisocial or oppression, social oppression. Uh, that's a good way to refer to it. Um, a jail time is kind of a socialist behavior as much as it's kind of fixed in nature. Um, whereas when people can pay fines to get out of jail or get a better lawyer to, to get out of jail, these are largely like fines and ways to use your money to avoid jail time. So anytime that that is a very prevalent thing with, within society, then you have um, social oppression within the society. And petty law is another example of social, imp social oppression. Um, and then you also have uh, uh, an, uh, another antisocial behavior is employees who steal from their employers or are lazy, etc. Um, if, if you have the option to quit and work for someone else, you do this. But if you get hired on to a job and then kind of intentionally or, you know, through negligence, you perform far less than what you say that you are going to do, then this is a way of destroying society or antisocial behavior. Um, cre increasing anxiety, hatred, and judgmentalism. You see this in the news today um, very much in the, the, the adult education. The adult education of America today uh, promotes uh, virtue signaling, racism, bigotry, um, judgmental behavior, uh, having increased anxiety and hatred for others. So this is a very anti-social or social oppressive behavior that the adult educators or the news um, participates in today. So you see this quite often. Um, and, and so anyways, so that's a, that's kind of with socialism. Now let's go over to communism. Now, a lot of people in America, they think that uh, communism doesn't exist in America. Well, it, it definitely does. Definitely. Um, if you ever go to a military base or on military operations, they are strongly communist. And this has been a thing all throughout um, history that um, anytime you have a militaristic operation or you have um, a harsh climate, such as the mountain regions of Europe, or the cold, re the colder regions of uh, the Nordic states. Anytime you have a harsh climate um, or a military operation, these groups of people become largely communist. And by communist, I mean uh, that there's not large displays of wealth. Um, that there's, they're also generically socialist as well. Uh, communists are almost always socialist whereas socialists are not always communist. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a minimum expectation of what each person is going to per do within the military organization. And there's some feeling of fairness. The, um, the beginners are going to end up, ha some of them are going to end up dying for the experienced leaders to continue what they're doing. So that's kind of... Um, and it, uh, colonization of Mars, Elon Musk just kind of throws this out there. But uh, some people think the colonization of Mars will have some people living in high-rise mansions while um, there will be a big army of slaves supporting the, Mars and the Martian colony. Uh, this is not how it would practically work. Uh, it would largely be a society of relative equals, but it would just be such a harsh environment. Nature itself would provide such an aggressive anti-human force that um, having wasteful people wouldn't really benefit uh, the, the climate uh, or benefit the society. So anytime nature is a very oppressive uh, force, then people kind of turn toward a, a forms of communism. Um, antitrust, anti-monopoly law, this is another form of communism within America. If you get too big, uh, then we'll cut you off and split you up. Um, riots and the destruction of property, this is uh, one form of communism. Uh, when people go around just breaking the rich people's stuff and reducing their wealth, um, that's a bit of a communist behavior. Now, it's not socialist. 
and that it doesn't benefit anybody else when you burn a rich man's house, but it does reduce um, the top wealth that people that you know have. Um, uh, now, some some other kind of communist behavior is uh, polluting, or 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 uh, I'll call this communist oppression. So when people are capable of polluting, um, and I don't, uh, people kind of conflate this with global warming, etc. It's not the same thing, but pollution, um, which is categorically negative, um, there's no, there's no, uh, no one can get confused on this, but pollution is a communist form of oppression. So if I'm capable of polluting and you have to pay the burden of that or you have to die from that and I don't pay you for that or I pay a, something very minimal uh, less than the cost of your death then um, I have a form of state protected uh, communistic oppression um, if I can pay a fine as a as a large organization if I can knowingly kill a big variety of people and settle this out with money um, then this is just, it's frankly, clearly uh, unfair and communistic oppression. Um, it's the use of money to, uh, to oppress those without money. Um, and when you think about commu uh, socialism and communism, socialism often deals with the future and the, dis the wide dispersion of assets, whereas communism, um, it's often uh, reflective of the past, or accumulated wealth and then it, you take a large portion of the high part of the accumulated wealth and you centralize it into a governmental agency or you centralize it into a central agency so communism is highly centralized whereas socialism is widely dispersed um, okay so another uh, form of communistic oppression is the economic collapse such as the banking uh, economic collapse in 2008 where the um, the the world banks or the American banks were protected by governments and then they collapsed and kind of destroyed society um, the military industrial complex is another form of communistic oppression so uh, people at large have no real choice of participating in the military industrial complex and we are forced into it through our government taxation which just throws into a giant pool um, they, they kind of say NASA um, education and the military are all one big old tax when a lot of people might not support the the industrial complex of the military as much if they had an option to um, and it's a very significant portion of the American budget um, let's see here uh, indulgences and fines um, back in Europe, you had Martin Luther doing the 95 uh, theses um, regarding the sale of indulgences or the paying of fines in order to um, excuse crime. And in America today, you definitely have some of that, uh, in particular with corporate crime. Um, you can incorporate yourself and basically commit all the crime you want to, and it will never be more than a fine or practically never or you can work for the government and then you can commit all the crime you want to and it won't be more than a fine or or it's you're just expli explicitly excluded from the possibility of the fine um, uh, or from jail time or in another way you can hire better lawyers um, etc and get out of uh, the crime that you did people really know that you committed it um, and you should serve jail time but you get a little bit better of a lawyer and people smear you in news for a small period of time and they say, oh, he paid about equal. No, uh, jail time. Jail time is socialist. And if people equally go to jail for crime, that's, you know, in one way, that's a good thing. But if only the poor people go to jail and the rich people pay a fine, then that is a form of communistic oppression within society. Um, and America definitely has aspects of that without a doubt. Um, another form of uh, communist uh, communistic oppression. Um, now this is more on the on the individualistic scale, but the waste or the burning of money, whereas uh, uh, pro -com uh, communistic uh, betterment, 
might be uh, the investing investing money in tools or or creating permanence so um, it for a person who is in charge of large amounts of societal money the, the money within this that society if they took all like the the Joker and uh, Batman is a great example of this but if if uh, the Joker when he grabs a huge pile of the mob's money or his money but when he takes this huge pile of the mob's money and he burns it and he sets gasoline on it and he says oh, I just want to watch the world burn well this is a form of communistic oppression and some people say oh you can do whatever you want with your money that's that's your that's your call um, this is not really true I mean yes you want to have individual uh, you have individual choice and individual betterment and that's sort of fine but if you have the people who are earning and acquiring the most wealth and then they just go about lighting all their wealth on fire or destroying their wealth um, in very clear ways then society at large um, suffers from this so you see the in the movie you have the Russian guy he's like oh my god you're burning you're burning the mobs money now we have less money to do mob stuff with and the jokers like whatever who cares but um but there's other people who invest their money or put their money into tools or put their money into um, creating permanent good. Um, a simple example that everyone's aware of, of course, is Elon Musk. Um, he's both creating a demand for highly educated people, so that's good, and he's creating assets that are useful for um, societies at large or the world at large. So he's in investing his money both in high technology or the future in people. And he's also investing his money for the production of assets. So Jeff Bezos is another example of a person who has his money invested in the production of assets. Um, um, an example of, uh, I, I won't really go into people who just waste and burn money. But we all we have all seen that before. Um, but like, let's just say if Jeff Jeff Bezos took his uh, billions of dollars, which he can't really access because it's all stock and traded. But if he took all this money, sold you know, cashed it into cash, bought Porsches with it, or or if he just paid ridiculous amounts for um, products and then crashed them into a wall, um, then it, the American society would be collectively damaged just from the absence and the destruction of all that wealth collectively. Um, you could say it's their choice, but that is a form of um, when, when uh, communism is negative. But the investment of tools, the investment of money into businesses, the investment into improving the performance of others, this is when uh, um, society's money is, is being used well. And there's there's nothing wrong with that or, or nothing to uh, just because someone has a lot of money does not make them a a damage to society. But if they're using that money to actively oppress, um, enslave people or if they're just destroying their money willy nilly, then this is a both of those things are not quite as good. So, OK, that's uh, that's kind of my talk on uh, separating socialism from communism. Um, in terms of the communists, I can't think of anybody in the American Revolution that was um, very much communist other than uh, generically the, the revolution as a whole was kind of communistic saying that um, they did not want the king owning the entirety of the American people and uh, and the objects within the people uh, are the objects on the continent. So the king at the time he owned, uh, he technically owned everything. But um, the American colonists, they agreed an amount of money that they would pay the king um, during in the separation. It wasn't a, a screw you, we're taking all this and we're not going to pay you back for the things we took. But the American colonists, they said, okay, everything from this point onward is ours, 
and we will pay you some amount of money for what you've given us before then. So that is something that the American colonists did, and this would be uh, very akin to, um, perhaps, this would be very akin to, um, you know, student loan, this certificate, this $1,000, $100,000 certificate that children are um, tricked into purchasing, um, or uh, definitely, a, definitely a terrible investment. But um, this is one of those things that uh, people, um, the, the idea of, of pay, repaying those who've invested into you even if you know even if you want them you know out of your organization for the future this is something that the american government has uh, typically always done um and believed in so that's that's one way um when we even though we um we were against one person owning all the people and the majority of the assets within the colony um even when we kicked that person out we just didn't take everything from them. We kind of wrote a bill and paid it off in some amount of time. So that's that's a little bit of the, and then when you think about, um, so communism kind of deals with the past, socialism deals with the future, and capitalism deals with the present. That's another way if you can think of how these things operate. And you can think of uh, communism as very, very much centralized Socialism is very well dispersed, or largely dispersed, and you can think of capitalism as distributed or networked. So um, organizations are kind of capitalist group projects. That's another form, uh, social clubs, those, uh, family dynasties. These are all examples of capitalism. And in, and in uh, communism or socialism, you have to have some kind of a government taxing or controlling the currency. And in capitalism, you can use metals or Bitcoin to um, just avoid the government altogether. So anytime you have a laissez-faire type of system, capitalism is the default mode that uh, systems go into. Whereas um, to in order to have a socialist or a communist system, then you have to, there must be a way to know where all the wealth is and take a piece of it from the top or there must be a way to know who doesn't who doesn't have the wealth and to give them a piece of it at the bottom but when you deal with metals um private banking um bitcoin and so forth these types of systems will naturally lend themselves toward a uh, capitalist type of behavior so um and this is a uh, yeah, late 1800s we had the gold standard and gold was our our form of capitalism but okay uh, I think that's pretty uh, and capitalism tends to be distributed so businesses there's a small business where the employer and the employees work together or the master and the slaves work together and then they network with other businesses to create an economy whereas um, in a purely communistic economy the government would tell everyone what to do um, and so forth and then uh, there's not really socialistic economies there, there sort of are but not really um, anyways so that's that kind of is that I guess a socialist economy um, slavery would be quite close to a socialistic economy frankly speaking but um, anyways so that's kind of a, a good description of you know how socialism can be good, how socialism is a part of our society, how it can be oppressed, uh, oppressive, or how people can oppress society through uh, social behaviors, how um, communist uh, can be good, and how communism is, is um, in incorporated into our society, such as in the military, and how communism can be oppressive, or the use of societal resources can be can be wasted and then uh, capitalism how capitalism is kind of mixed in with all that and how how capitalist societies are organized okay and that's all I got hope you enjoyed it bye bye